beginning of this year, um, I worked on a project for a startup called Speaker. Um, and this helps kids express uh, how they're feeling if they're not comfortable doing it verbally. So you basically get these five faces and you click on the expression that um, best fits how they're feeling. And uh, the kids can write a message if they want. And it helps teachers spot uh, problems, uh, say kids are being bullied at school. And um, we're still looking for funding if there are any millionaires in the room. Um, so we've, we've visited loads of schools, uh, loads of primary schools, to test a prototype app. Um, and uh, so it's a web app. And we asked whether they had internet at home and what kind of devices they had. And we wanted the kids to be able to use, um, use a site in privacy um, because we didn't want other people sort of looking over their shoulder and influencing what expression they chose. Um, sharing a machine, it's not really possible to do that. And we found out that only 44% had their own computer that they didn't share with their sibling. And of those who had mobile phones, so 46% had mobile phones, um, only 10% of those were a smartphone. Um, but we did find out that 95% had internet access at home. We just threw in this question about game consoles um, just to kind of ease us into it. And we found out that kids were more likely, um, primary school age kids were more likely to own a, a game console than a mobile phone. Um, so it was 69% for portable consoles and 86% for TV consoles. So I got this second-hand DS to see what the experience was like. And that's where my journey um, exploring game consoles, uh, game console browsers began. Um, this is the, the DS I'm talking about. So I'm going to quickly run through the evolution of um, game consoles, just because I think it's useful to see how it's influenced web development. Um, game consoles are split into generations. And when new features come out, this often sparks a new generation of consoles. The dates, um, they're not very accurate because consoles come out at different times in different regions. So the first uh, home, commercial home console was uh, Magnavox Odyssey. Um, that, that came out in 1972. And the second generation, this was dominated by the Atari 2600. <laughs> 1980, um, there was the Nintendo, uh, <laughs> the Nintendo Game & Watch. Um, so you probably recognise um, it looks a little bit like a DS. Um, and this is where the modern D-pad was born. The, the Vectrex, I quite like this one, um, it used vector rather than raster graphics, and it needed these colour overlay sheets to be placed over the screen. <laughs> the third generation, this was often called the 8-bit um, the era. Um, there was a video game crash in 1983 um, that was caused by just lots of really kind of low quality games coming out. And, um, oh, I forgot about those. <laughs> um, as a result, Nintendo set these really strict standards for game licensing to ensure quality. Um, and that meant the other consoles really struggled. Um, things like the Atari 7800 um, games that were played on, um, on Nintendo systems couldn't be played for another two years on, on other systems. Uh, the fourth generation, this was, this was called the 16-bit era, and it had um, higher resolution sprites and more colours. Um, 1989, uh, the first uh, Nintendo Game Boy. Uh, this was the first major handheld console, and it goes through a number of iterations over the years, including like the Game Boy Color in 1998 and things like the Game Boy Advance. Um, this was around sort of my era. 1993, um, this device came out, it's like a peripheral, it's uh, called the Sega Activator, um, and it's a peripheral for the Sega Mega Drive, and it was ranked the third worst uh, game peripheral ever by IGN. Um, it's kind of a, you, you place it on the floor and you stand in the middle and you kind of move your arms about um, and it, it detects sort of gesture, but it was really, they hadn't tested it in rooms with light fittings or ceiling fans. <laughs> So how many of you knew that Apple made a console? Quite a few, cool. Um, it was called the Apple Bandai Pippin. Uh, it was designed by Apple, and it was manufactured by Bandai. Um, Apple would rather you forget it ever existed, um, just because it was so unsuccessful. There was just so much competition around at this time. Um, and it tried to be like a computer, but um, it was too expensive to be marketed as a, as a game console. Um, so it just didn't, it didn't really fit anywhere. 
Um, the Nintendo Virtual Boy, uh, I just threw this one in because I think it's quite sweet. It's a, it, it was like a 3D virtual reality game. Um, did, did really appallingly as well. 1997, the Game.com game came out. Did, did, anyone, did anyone own one? Uh, it, it didn't do very well either. Um, it, but it was the first console with a browser. And it was a portable console, which is pretty cool. 1998, uh, there was a Sega Dreamcast, and that was the first console with a built-in modem. Um, and you could get the browser separately on a disk. And in 2000, uh, the PS2 came out. That had internet capabilities, um, and it needed a network access disk for the browser. 2003, the, uh, the Engage, um, often called the Taco Phone. This was a hybrid phone uh, gaming device, and it, it had a browser. Um, probably not a very good one. Uh, 2004, the Nintendo DS, that's this device. And uh, the PSP, um, which is this one. Uh, they came out, and they were the first in a whole range of, of portable consoles of this type um, with internet capabilities. Um, the DS, this needs, a, it's got a, like a separate browser cartridge. Uh, well, this is, this is the expansion pack because it's, it's got so little memory. It's got four megabytes of memory, um, so it needs an expansion pack. Um, and it, this is a browser cartridge. Yeah, it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> the Xbox 360 came out in um, 2005, um, and it's only just come out with a browser. Um, so it's had internet capabilities for a while, but it hasn't had a browser. Um, but I'll talk about this in a bit. In 2006, the PS3 and the Wii came out, um, and they've had browsers for quite a few years, and again, I'll, I'll talk about them some more. And then there was this big lull in TV consoles, um, and a lot more focus on portable ones with browsers. So the DSi, this is, um, this, is uh, this one, and this, this has more em emphasis on the internet capabilities. Then there was the Xperia Play, which is, um, it's kind of like a, it's a bit like the Taco phone. It's a hybrid uh, console and a phone. It's an Android phone, um, and it's got little PlayStation kind of controls on it. And then the PS Vita came out in 2011. Um, and this, this device comes with optional 3G, um, so there's a real emphasis on the kind of internet capabilities. And coming soon, We've got the Wii U. This comes out in a couple of weeks, so keep an eye out. Um, the Ouya, which is built on Android. And the Razer Switchblade. This has like, a bunch of different keys on it. And the keys, the icons on them change depending on what game you're playing or if you're using it as a computer. Uh, the successor to the PS3 is coming out. That's, that's codenamed Orbis. And there'll be a successor to the Xbox 360 in a year or so. Um, and that's rumoured to have sort of built-in connect and always on internet. So TV consoles, they're not just for gaming, and they're now being marketed as complete entertainment solutions. So I had a look at the demographics of who owns consoles, just to get an idea of who's potentially using the browser in them. And I referenced two studies. One is Ofcom, and the other is, um, which is based in the UK, and the other is Pew Internet, which is based in the US. So it's more or less what you'd expect. Um, generally, uh, TV consoles and portable consoles are popular with sort of young adults and children. Um, but there's a little spike uh, in the portable game consoles with, with adults aged between 30 to 49. Portable game consoles are really popular amongst um, 12 and 13 year olds. And um, based on the speaker research I did at schools, I'm sure this would be higher if, um, if the survey had done, been done with even younger children. Boys are more likely to own uh, TV consoles than girls, which um, isn't really surprising. Um, and with children with portable game consoles, again, boys, uh, it's more common for boys than girls. And then as people get older, that gap narrows. So women are only slightly less likely to own a TV console. And when it comes to um, portable consoles, women are more likely to own a portable console than men. But this doesn't tell us um, who's using the browsers. And fortunately, there's, there's some data on that as well. So game consoles are the fourth most popular way to access the internet. Um, this study was done in the US as well, and they came up with very similar results. 
And this is a US study. Uh, amongst 12 to 17 year olds, uh, TV consoles were only slightly less popular than mobile phones as a way to get online. And I think this is maybe because uh, children in this age group, they're too young to own a phone, and phones are expensive and fragile, and, and games are really sort of marketed at, at young children. Ofcom asked different age groups if they were using game consoles to visit websites specifically, and they found out that 11% overall do this, and between 16 to 24-year-olds, that figure is a massive 20%. So if this is your target audience, you really need to be looking at this. And people are using console browsers in the same way that people have been using the browsers in their phones to do just everyday things. Uh, this example, this is a bank. It's not a kid's site, um, but they found out that 20 people had tried to join the bank using their PlayStation 3. It, it's really fun kind of optimising sites for the best experience out there, things like retina screens. Um, but most people don't actually have the latest technology like we do. Uh, so when I was looking around schools, I noticed that they were all using these really kind of poor quality Dell monitors, uh, really kind of pixelated, and the settings, are, sort of contrast is really bad. But this is normal, you know, they don't all have these kind of glossy Apple screens. And consoles are kind of the same because they don't really get updated much. Um, so, and, and the, the screens, you know, it's, well, I'll show you later on. So these are the most popular consoles that are out today. Um, I faded out the ones that I haven't tested and I crossed out the PSP E1000 uh, because that doesn't have internet capabilities. So I don't have time to show you all the devices today, so I'll just show you the latest ones. And if you want to look at kind of the older ones for nostalgia, um, you can just go on this website. So I'm using the HTML5 test and CSS3 test as kind of benchmarks, just to get an idea of the browser support. Um, and just to give you an idea of that, so um, I tested uh, my version of Chrome on my desktop uh, last night, and that was that came as a score was 434 out of 500, and 62% um, on the CSS3 test. So in 2000 and, uh, 2006, the Nintendo Wii came out, and that had built-in Wi-Fi, um, and the browser came out in 2007, and it cost 500 Wii points to download, but then in 2009, they made that free. You move the cursor by um, pointing the Wiimote at the screen. Uh, so this is the Wiimote. It's uh, very fiddly to do if you've got really small links. Um, it's a bit like using kind of like a laser pointer and you're just trying to click on things. Um, so having kind of uh, spaced apart links and big clickable areas really helps. Text on TV is really difficult to read from a distance, so they've got this uh, plus and minus button you can use to zoom in and out. And pressing, uh, pressing two on the um, Wiimote, it linearizes the page, so it's kind of, it generates this kind of, almost like a mobile style sheet. The Xbox 360, this came out in 2006, and it hasn't had a browser until i9 uh, for Xbox was released a couple of weeks ago. And it requires um, a wide internet connection, or you can buy a separate Wi-Fi adapter. If you enable this setting in, um, in the i9 browser, uh, it linearizes, it basically serves up um, a mobile, uh, the mobile site if there is one. So what, the way it does this is it, it actually switches its user agent string to, um, to a mobile one. So if, there is, if you do land on a site that has a mobile um, version, then they will serve you up this. But it just uh, doesn't really work very well. It kind of just looks a bit squashed. You can also tick this setting, uh, use my whole TV screen to show web content, and what this does, so I've got the default view on the left and the fill the screen option on the right, and you can see it kind of cuts stuff off. So be very careful when you're, when you're designing sites not to keep stuff, you know, to keep stuff sort of away from the edges. 2006, the um, Sony PlayStation 3 came out, and this has a built-in Blu-ray player and built-in Wi-Fi, and it uses a WebKit version of Netfront. And this is what it does. It kind of constrains the width of, uh, of sites. Um, either side, those are, those are additional tabs you can have open. And you can, you can flip between them um, using the bumpers on, on the top of the, the controller. And it's kind of nice that it does this, because it keeps line lengths nice and short. Um, but it does make the text quite small. So it may not be the most advanced browser, but I really like the PS3 controller, because it, it makes use of every button on the device. This is the um, PS Vita. 
It's got this optional 3G model, and so internet capabilities are sold as a key feature. Um, and the, the browser is quite capable. I mean, it, it's an app front version of WebKit, um, but it, you can have up to eight browser windows open at once. And this is what sites look like um, on the screen. So they render relatively well. Um, there are media queries for things like max and min width work. And um, it's always in landscape mode. And the, the screen alone is the entire size of an iPhone 4. So um, this is the, it's just a screenshot of the PSP 1000, um, just to show you how much of an improvement it is on older models. Um, so it has really, this, this device has really poor CSS support. Um, like here, it's, it, it just doesn't understand sprites at all. So the reader itself, it's, it's basically just a fat touch screen, and it doesn't make use of, of any of the buttons on the device, which I think is a shame, because it's always nice to, have, to be able to use those buttons. One feature it does have that's, that's really nice is this touchpad on the back. Um, so if you're playing a game, uh, you, can, you can sort of touch the back of the screen so that your thumbs don't get in the way of the screen. Um, but it, unfortunately, they don't, they don't use this in the browser, but maybe one day they will. This is the 3DS XL, which is a kind of a bigger version of the 3DS. This came out a couple of months ago. Um, it's got a larger screen than the 3DS, and it's all of these DS devices, they have two screens. Um, the bottom screen is a touch screen, but it's, um, it's resistive rather than capacitive like an iPhone. So it's like the, the, the screen on the back of an airplane seat. Um, and you get a little stylus with it as well, which is cute. The, the top screen, it's 3D, um, and you can adjust the effect using a slider on, on the side of the device. Um, and all of the older DS models use, um, use Opera, but um, they don't use Opera anymore. Uh, they use a WebKit version of NetFront. So the, you'll notice that the top screen is slightly wider than the bottom screen, um, and there's always a gap sort of at the edge of each page. Um, so just sort of bear that in mind. The limitation that, these, that all of these devices have um, is the memory. Uh, it's quite low compared to something like a smartphone. Um, so console browsers, they can't support more advanced features of HTML and CSS until the devices have the capabilities to do the job without crashing or running out of memory. So this device in particular, it has 128 megabytes of RAM. Um, and the iPhone, which came out, the iPhone 5, which came out at a similar time, that has a gigabyte. And older models, they use, um, you have to buy the browsers uh, separately as a cartridge, or you have to download them from the App Store. But newer models, it's built in, and you, know, you just go to the home screen, and it's already there. So yeah, this, this device is like a 3D device, so I, I bet you're all really excited about being able to look at 3D websites. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, you can't view 3D images within a website. You have to click on them and download them and view them in a separate app. Um, and I know you're thinking that's a shame. But, um, so the, the, the 3D uh, image itself, uh, it's .mpo format. And that's basically two single JPEGs kind of layered over each other. And the fallback for that is a single JPEG. So you can still display them on websites. Um, so I was thinking how sad it is that you can't view kind of 3D sites, but then, then I remembered sites like this and just <laughs> how awful that would be. So you can zoom in and out on, on the device, and that actually affects how text wraps. And this means that you don't have to keep scrolling around the screen to, to read sort of long line lengths, uh, which is quite a nice feature. Uh, the Wii U, this, this I mentioned is coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, so November 18th in the US and November 30th in the UK. And internet has gone from being a really nice to have feature to being a really key feature of the device. Um, so it's got an accelerometer, a microphone, a speaker, and a webcam. Um, and it actually, if you're playing a game, you can pause the game and you can go into the browser and it will have saved the name of that game so that you can kind of search for it quicker. So they've really kind of thought about the integration of games and, and browsing. Um, often people will look up sort of cheat codes to games uh, on the console. And it's got two gigabytes of memory. So that means um, that what they've done is they've dedicated one gigabyte to games and one gigabyte for the system. Um, I don't know what the browser is, but um, I had a look on HTML5 test, and they've actually already got the Nintendo Wii stats. Um, so it's 323 HTML5 points. 
Now, I've put alongside it the Xbox browser, which came out a, a few weeks ago. It's IE9. That scores 120. It's even better. It's like three points better than IE10. So I'm really excited about this device. And it's got all of these cool features. Um, yeah, I really hope it's true as well. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. So one of the common problems that consoles have um, is they don't have flash. Um, or if they do have flash, it's really out of date because the console's kind of slightly old and they don't, they don't kind of update the system very much. Um, and often there's no support for the HTML5 video tag. Um, so that means people just can't go to YouTube and they get very upset and sort of comment loads on sites about how upset they are about that. So there's really high demand for video content on the TV. So it makes sense for browser manufacturers to kind of think about this um, when they're integrating the browser into the console. And hopefully, this is going to drive standards and stuff. So the Wii U, um, this isn't anything to do with browsers, but I just think it's really cool. Um, it does, you can do this thing called asymmetric gameplay, which means that you can, if you've, if you've got friends who have different devices, um, it kind of, you, you, it enhances the gameplay, so you can, you can play a game where you've got, say, someone with a gamepad, uh, they're the map, and the people with the um, Wiimotes are using, like, torches or using them as swords. Um, so you can have kind of different roles dif de um, depending on what device you have. Second screens, they're a, a feature of every sort of TV console now. Um, and there's a bunch of different patterns depending on what device it is, so um, have a read-through of these. You can pair a PS Vita with a PS3 and play PS3 games on it. Um, this is called Remote Play. And with the Xbox, you can, uh, you can download Xbox uh, Smart Glass on your phone. So Android phone, Windows phone, iOS. Um, iOS version came out a couple of days ago. This lets you pair any device with the Xbox 360 to use as a controller. And I really like this solution because it, it feels a lot more sustainable than buying a separate device. Um, because it's not specific to any device. Um, similar to this technique is the BlackBerry Bridge and Apple's AirPlay. So on the, on the far left, I've got... Um, this is just a normal trackpad, and you can, if you're in the browser, you can, you can type in a URL or search, um, and you can, you can change the type of um, input, so you can, you can kind of have... You can use a controller as well as using a trackpad. And the Wii U, this is this uh, sort of naturally second-screen device. Um, but one of the things you have to consider is um, when optimising for small screen, remember that content could be mirrored to a large screen. So have a think about how that might work. One of the ways that second screen is, um, is working, is, is helping people uh, use their TV, is, is being used as a keyboard. Because typing really sucks on, on, on these TV devices. Uh, so if you're using something like a Wii, uh, it's an especially unpleasant experience because just, just trying to kind of click on things and it's a little bit laggy and um, it's just a bit of a pain. So um, some console makers, they've come out with these like clip-on keyboards, um, which is a kind of, it's a nice solution, I guess. Uh, YouTube, uh, they've come out with something called Lean Back. So if you go to youtube.com forward slash Lean Back, you can pair your, your phone with the screen and use it as a controller, and it, it kind of feels like magic. Each console has a different way of displaying content, and they all have different screen sizes and different levels of support and different features, but the way that we interact with them is completely different as well. So we could be interacting with them with our fingers, with a stylus, a D-pad, a thumbstick, remote control, or even gesture and voice. But at the moment, the output is exactly the same. So if you wanted to take advantage of the console's features, first you have to detect what the console is. And this presents quite a few challenges. Um, just an aside about analytics, if you're wondering why you're not seeing kind of DS, um, DS browsers in your analytics, uh, remember that, that some of the older DS models, uh, they, don't, they don't really run JavaScript very well um, or, for, or at all. Um, so that's why it's not being tracked. Also, um, I haven't found any debugging tools for the browsers uh, in these consoles, so you're basically coding blind. Another challenge um, is with gesture and touch, like big clickable areas like this keyboard is really good for kind of, um, you know, if you're using like a, a Wiimote. 
Um, it just makes it a lot easier. But if, you're, if you've got your Xbox controller plugged in and you're using something like the analog stick, tra traversing between these letters, it takes a long time. And it actually hinders, um, you know, it, it basically hinders typing. And so detection, it doesn't tell you um, how the interface is about to be used. It might tell you what's plugged in, like a connect is plugged in, so maybe they'll be using voice or gesture, but it doesn't tell you, well, actually, they'd rather use a controller. So this is the, um, the PS Vita's user agent string. Uh, it contains a st substring called Silk 3.2, and I had a little look around to find out what Silk 3.2 was. Um, and the only thing I could find was the, the browser for the Kindle um, is, is Silk. So let's say you were doing kind of user agent string sniffing to target the Kindle Fire. Um, you'd also pick up the PS Vita. And this is why I'd recommend against doing user agent string sniffing. Um, it encourages browser vendors to include other browser strings. Um, and it also means, like, in the worst cases, uh, it makes some sites not work at all on completely capable devices. So, like, this is, this is my Android tablet, um, and I'm trying to use Google Maps and Firefox, uh, but the site is giving me an error saying that it's not supported on my iPhone. Fuzzy device detection isn't very reliable either. So, like, these two DS devices, they're saying it's not a mobile, it's not a mobile device, it's not a tablet, but it is a computer. Whereas this PS Vita is saying um, it is a mobile, it is a mobile device, it is a tablet, but it's not a computer. And what does tablet even mean? I mean, we think of it as like a touchscreen, but these touchscreens have buttons. Um, do we define these as tablets as well, or are they something different? And remember, it's not just the device that's important, it's the inputs that are being used and the environments are in. So when new and weirder devices come out, it gets even harder to draw the line. And we need to be thinking about ways to develop sustainably that aren't going to encourage bad habits from browser vendors. Most of the time, I don't think we need to detect what the, whether it's a console, because some of these console browsers, they do a perfectly good job of serving up content. And some, con some consoles, they automatically adapt the site for us to make it more usable. Things like pressing 2 on the Nintendo Wii or using the, uh, using the zoom buttons on the, on the 3DS to, um, to get the text to wrap. I think our only sensible option is making our sites better for, for these devices without doing any sort of detection. And as a result, that makes our sites easier to use on even more devices. An example of this approach is a Vimeo site, which has something called Couch Mode. So if you click on this button, this lets you switch into a more simple interface uh, that's good for lots of different contexts and inputs and devices. There are still situations where you want to detect, such as to map the uh, actions um, of, a, of a controller, map them to actions. Um, but even though console browsers, they aren't very advanced, the devices themselves are packed full of these interesting features. Um, so it is quite fun to experiment with these. So do any of you remember this Google Doodle? <laughs> It came out during the Olympics, um, and it's a little running game. Uh, and you know, it, it indicates here that you use a keyboard to, to run. But if you had, a, if you had um, a PlayStation controller, it comes with this charging cable, which is a USB. And if you plug that into your computer, you can actually, um, it uses a gamepad API. If you're using something, a modern version of Chrome or Firefox, um, you can actually play the game with your, uh, with your PlayStation controller. And there's this excellent um, GamePad API demo that goes with the article. Um, so if you have one of these, plug it in and give it a go. Um, what it does, it shows you which buttons are being pressed and um, which direction and stuff. So Rob Hawks, he's been turning his Mac Mini into a console, and he's using the GamePad API, and he's tweaked the Mac to boot as like a console as possible. Connect.js, um, this is a JavaScript library that, that helps you make games for the browser if you're into doing this. Um, and you can use the, the Xbox Connect as a controller. And it tracks up to two people at once. Uh, and there's loads of demos on the site, so have a look at them. Depth.js, this is an extension um, that, that enables you to use your Connect to interact with the browser. Um, they have lots of demos on their site where they're doing things like swiping between tabs with their hands. Um, and it's definitely worth a play 
if you have a connect. Uh, this was an April Fool's joke, which I was completely fooled by, and uh, <laughs> I was going to tell you how great it is. Um, but yeah, I'm sure it could be built. WeJS, this is a, um, a library that lets you use up to four Wiimotes to interact with a website. Um, I'm trying to figure out how that would actually work. It might be quite annoying. Google have lots of documentation um, on designing for TVs, which is really worth a read. There's, there's lots of useful stuff here, for, especially for designers. It's things like um, what colours you should avoid and um, sort of contrast levels, that sort of thing. One of the forms of input that I haven't talked about much is, uh, is gesture. Um, I wish I had more time to de dedicate to this. So I've, I've mentioned the Xbox three, uh, 360's Connect quite a few times. Um, it's a really, really advanced piece of kit, so it can detect and differentiate gestures uh, from several people at once. And it's, it's on my Christmas wish list. <laughs> so have a look at the Connect Human Interface guidelines if you want to learn more about gesture. Um, they're really interesting, and they, it has loads of tips, like children will tend to make faster, wilder, or more exaggerated movements for the same gestures. The PlayStation's equivalent um, is a device called uh, the Move. Um, it, it's more accurate than the Kinect, but it, it doesn't have as many interesting applications. Uh, this is the Kinect. It's being used in a virtual dressing room, which is quite a nice application for it. Um, it's also being used in um, surgeries where they can sort of have a look at, at scans without touching a screen, so it's kind of more hygienic. Voice is another feature that's useful when typing is a pain, um, but it's had quite a slow take up because it's been really inaccurate in the past. And it's quite challenging to do well if there are other people in the room talking or if the person speaking has, has even a slight accent. So often these have trigger words. Um, Jeremy, how do you turn on your TV? TV, on. <laughs> <laughs> so the Connect Human Interface Guidelines have some really useful tips on, uh, on working with content that uses voice for input. As a general rule, always have a fallback for if voice interface can't be used. Um, so this is some really interesting stuff coming out from Disney. Um, it's called Disney Touche. So normally, touch is a binary input. You're either touching something or you're not touching something. But here they're, using, they're tracking it as a waveform. So depending on um, how many fingers you're using, how you're gripping it, how hard you're, you're gripping it, um, it will change the waveform, and that means you can have different outputs. So an example of this is um, using your body to... Uh, so you can slide your fingers up the arm and that will change the volume on your phone. Um, I, I just really like this as, as a kind of concept. That, that, that's not Danny. Um, it looks like him, though. Uh, so it feels like we've only just moved away from desktop to mobile and, and tablets, but we're still looking at just a fraction of the web, and we still have quite a long way to go. So the future is in these weird devices. That they just don't fit snugly into mobile or tablet or desktop. And the way that we interact with them is going to be much more varied. So in the future, it will be harder to draw the line between a console and other devices. Um, things like the iPod Touch, that's, been, that's a really successful gaming device, but it's not actually a gaming device. It's, it's you know, a media player. Um, and the, I think the normality will be uh, unusual screen sizes, two screens, even no screens. So I've got some takeaways here. Um, so, other than test on the real thing, uh, expect more diverse input, so think about things like gesture, um, touch, uh, voice, um, using a stylus. Have fallbacks if one form of input isn't available, like I said, with, um, with voice. Uh, so, if uh, someone might have a Kinect plugged in, but they might be in a really noisy room, so not able to use voice, so have a fallback for that. Make text in clickable areas bigger. Um, so generally, it, the, the, the most sort of unusable aspect of using a TV console is just that links are too small and it's, it's really difficult to click on them. Um, so just make them a little bit bigger and, and I'll be happier. Test hover interactions. So when I was using the Xbox uh, 360's browser, um, you, when you're using like, the analog stick to, to move around, uh, I, kept, I, kept, I kept hovering over things as I was traversing um, that would, it would just basically um, trigger a hover interaction that was really annoying, like a big menu opening. Just, oh. 
So try and avoid that or just test it really thoroughly. And test on poorly configured screens, things like these, these old Dell monitors, they're still being like, used by, by schools and by um, universities. Um, so make sure you, that, that the contrast is, is high enough. Reduce page weight. So a, a lot of these consoles, they, they have very low RAM, and it means that a lot of, um, a lot of sites, they just don't load at all, or it'll, it'll crash halfway through. Um, so make sure you optimize your sites like, like you were doing already. And think future-friendly. So the future-friendly site, it's still got a lot of relevant stuff that applies to game consoles. So have a read through that and make sure you're developing sustainably. So I had this idea that we could have a hack day um, where we just basically get a load of game consoles that have browsers and um, we try and make some fun stuff with it. Um, but I'm not, I'm not very good at organising events, so if anyone in the room wants to do that, then I'd love to come along and I'll bring all these. And this is where um, I'm, keep, I'm recording everything, so you can have a look at all of the capabilities of the browsers and things. Um, and that's all I've got time for. Thank you.